You wake up, gasping for air, struggling to peel yourself from your bed. When you do manage to get your feet on the ground, it feels like they're glued down tight. You're twice as heavy. It feels like you're carrying another you on your shoulders all day long. Well, congratulations. You've woken up on an Earth where uncontrolled experiments with dark matter have doubled the force of gravity. Mass panic happens when over 8,000 aircraft fall as soon as the gravity spikes, crashing into buildings, forests, and oceans. And that's because airplanes suddenly lost the balance between the pull of gravity and the lift force necessary to keep them cruising. Pilots did attempt to save their planes, but GPS failed as satellites swiftly moved. After a month, humans begin to look more and more like chimps. Bones are getting thicker, and the immense force constantly pulling people down is squashing their spines, making everybody bend over. People start figuring out that walking ape-style on all fours helps with better balance and stability. And that becomes a big deal, since even tripping over a tiny rock could lead to a nasty fracture. Falls not only get more intense due to the extra forces on bones and joints, but they also happen faster. Gravity's pull doubles the acceleration force, increasing it from 32 feet per second to 64 feet per second. Your house is not a safe place anymore. Old buildings and bridges all over the world are now collapsing. Inside those still standing, residents get the scary feeling that the whole place is shaking, and cracks start showing up everywhere. It's dangerous to stay inside houses, as roofs are now twice their usual weight and any rain or snow also feels twice as heavy. Car alarms are constantly going off because tree branches keep falling all over the place. Most trees simply can't bear the weight of gravity, and only strong and small plants survive, like cactuses and succulents. Six months after the sudden change, supermarkets have a sinister vibe going on, with shelves nearly empty and people arguing over the last loaf of bread. You get frustrated to see that your favorite Japanese restaurant is now five times more expensive. And it's not just about salmon prices. It's rice that has become a rare luxury item, since the gravity boost has messed up the photosynthesis process, and the seeds are taking too long to grow. On the flip side, carrots are now cheaper than ever. They're sprouting and growing at lightning speed. People start eating so many carrots that human skin now has an orange glow from all that extra beta-carotene. Farmers are getting creative, using artificial supports to keep plants like tomatoes and corn on their feet. But even with all their efforts, it's hard to get a good harvest. Summer has arrived, and even your air conditioner can't relieve the unbearable heat. A sudden change in gravity disrupted Earth's orbit around the Sun, pushing it into a new, tighter elliptical path. Earth now passes much closer to the Sun than it used to, making your sunscreen simply surrender. The Moon's orbit has also had some dramatic changes, leading to more dangerous and extreme tide patterns. High tides are now higher, and low tides are lower. This shift has also triggered widespread volcanic eruptions and earthquakes on an unprecedented scale. Earth's crust starts to rupture across vast areas, unleashing planet-wide lava flows so intense that living on Venus begins to sound like a pretty good idea. Five years later, people notice that puppies are begging for food twice as much, but they are taking more time to grow. Breeds like beagles look thinner, and their leg bones are getting heavier. Even insects, such as locusts, now have thicker hind legs to keep those jumps going. Sea creatures are being crushed by the much greater weight of the water around them. It's not a big deal for animals used to deep ocean pressures, like the anglerfish. But crabs and lobsters are really struggling since they live in shallow waters. Sloths and monkeys develop a stronger grip so they won't fall off trees. For carnivorous animals living in jungles or savannas, life is a real challenge because any animal the size of a wolf or bigger can't run without breaking a leg. Large predators like lionesses are starving because they can't move fast enough to catch their prey. Tall trees like palms and pines also go through evolutionary changes. They get beefier trunks and only grow about half as tall as usual. This way, water and nutrients can travel from the ground up to their leaves without struggling against gravity so badly. 
10 years have passed since gravity increased. Airlines have finally made changes to prevent commercial flights from nosediving. The wings of airplanes are now longer, pilots have learned to fly at altitudes twice as high, and flight speed has increased by 41%. To avoid people getting extremely nauseated and dizzy during takeoffs and landings, seats are now fully horizontal, like first-class bed-like setups, specially designed to minimize the nasty effects of gravity times two. Flight attendants are trained to raise the seat at the passenger's feet after they pass out so that blood can return to their head. The thing is, when gravity gets a power boost, it yanks your blood down to your feet and hands even more than usual, making your heart work extra hard to pump that blood around, especially to your head. 50 years have passed. Women in their 30s look like they are 60. Higher gravity decreases collagen synthesis, so even though they're still young, they're dealing with more wrinkles and fine lines, and their skin has already lost a big part of its elasticity. Wounds as small as a pimple pop or a paper cut also take much more time to heal. So people are excited about the creation of a band-aid made from fish skin from cod or tilapia that promotes local blood circulation and speeds up the healing process. People have also got used to wear exoskeletons made of titanium, which support and enhance the wearer's strength. This technology features cool joints of the places that copy humans' natural movements, giving people more flexibility and letting them move around more easily. Prototypes of personal flying devices start popping up after 100 years. The gray flyer is like a jetpack made of carbon nanotubes, making the structure strong without adding much weight. Instead of using fuel for propulsion, the device has these super-thin but high-tech solar panels. Investors are still not sure if humans could fly long distances with it, but the gray flyer definitely can help people tackle tasks that have become almost impossible, like climbing a mountain or grabbing something from the attic. Things at the gym are pretty different too. The anti-gravity treadmill is a favorite among fitness enthusiasts because it uses air pressure to lift users, reducing the discomfort of gravity while running. People can also lift weights in booths when the gravity settings are customized. When training with G-Force set at 3 or 4 times the new normal, muscles get stronger, making double gravity seem more bearable. However, the maximum set is 4.6, otherwise bones might crack. Over 500 years have passed. Thanks to these amazing technological creations, humans can now handle and establish colonies in other parts of the universe. A popular choice for family vacations is Kepler 452b, a planet about 60% larger than Earth, orbiting in the habitable zone of a sun-like star. Kids especially like that place, as oceans have been discovered and hotels have been built near rocky beaches. On the other hand, traveling to places in the universe with lighter gravity is like going to an oasis of tranquility. So Mars and the Moon have become known for amazing yoga retreats. With their gravitational forces much weaker, people can breathe more easily there and move around with more freedom. Keep in mind that these trips are expensive, so you might want to start saving up now. The near future. Our planet is running out of energy sources, and the human population is growing. There's less free space on Earth every year. People have to move to other planets as soon as possible. But there isn't enough energy for spaceships and interstellar voyages. You're a member of a group of scientists searching for energy sources in the universe. Solar power, windmills, hydro and thermal power plants. It's not enough. You offer an adventurous but risky idea. You want to create an object and accelerate it to the speed of light. This object will start generating infinite energy. Other scientists immediately reject this idea. Such an experiment can destroy the entire planet and even the solar system. If something moves faster than light particles, it creates a black hole. To reduce the risks, you suggest speeding up a small and thin object, like a simple needle. As soon as it reaches the speed of light and releases energy, special machines similar to solar panels will absorb this energy. Only one millisecond of moving at the speed of light will be enough for humanity. Then the needle should be stopped. You suggest to slow it down with the help of Mount Everest. You want the needle to smash into it. 
as soon as you start working on the experiment, you face an unsolvable problem. An ordinary needle, like any other object with mass, can't reach the speed of light. According to the laws of physics, it's impossible. To do this, you need to turn the needle into a beam of photons. The metal of the needle will be erased into dust during acceleration to the speed of light. Earth's atmosphere shows strong resistance to a moving object. So now, you need to create the strongest durable material in the universe. It not only has to withstand the air resistance, but also not be torn apart by the energy growing in it. When any object increases its speed, its energy increases too. You need a lot of money to create such a needle. But before you get it, you have to conduct this experiment in a simulation program to prove you're doing the right thing. This program is a computer hologram of the solar system. The program imitates and visualizes all the laws of physics. You can run your experiment using this model, and if it goes well, you'll get money to implement your plan. So, you create a computer simulation of the needle. Then, you build a machine with an incredibly powerful engine. It works like a rocket. Several motors are attached to the needle. They help reach the speed of sound, then charge the needle with energy and release it. Using the charge force, the needle should accelerate to the speed of light and crash into Everest. You'd need to set the launch spot of the needle a long way from the mountain for the whole operation to work out. Air resistance greatly hinders the acceleration. The needle's path must pass through thousands of miles of free space. You decide that it's better to launch the experiment from space, where there's no resistance. To do this, you build a base on the moon in the simulation. Computers calculate the exact start time and needle position. You need to know the speed of the Earth's movement around its axis and the Moon's movement around our planet. The slightest deviation from the course can cause the needle to crash into the ocean or a city. If it gets into the water, severe floods and tsunamis will happen all around the world. The computer calculates the ideal moment for the needle to fly. You're ready to start the operation. Scientists and presidents of different countries are watching the simulation. You're so nervous, you're sweating. You come up to the computer and press the start button. Everyone is looking at the big screen. A rocket with a needle placed on top flies up. It's rising high above the moon. It reaches the speed of sound. The first engine falls off. The rocket's mass decreases and its speed increases. Half the distance between our planet and the moon is gone. There's two engine turbines left. The speed of sound is exceeded by 10 times. The second engine falls off. The needle is approaching the Earth's atmosphere. The third engine generates a huge charge of energy, strikes it into the needle, and flies away. The needle turns bright red and hot like the sun. It penetrates the Earth's atmosphere. The protective layers of our planet can't prevent the needle from reaching its goal. The sky lights up with a bright flash. In the next half second, the needle will hit Everest at the speed of light. Two seconds later, your experiment will fail. And here's why. The greater the speed of any object, the larger the mass and the amount of energy that accumulates inside. When the needle reaches the speed of light, its energy begins to increase indefinitely. The mass grows to infinity. And when this happens, a black hole is formed, a massive object with an incredible gravitational force that absorbs absolutely everything even light particles, photons, and the time dimension. This is called the event horizon. Literally, everything that is an event, time, space, matter, is absorbed by the black hole. No one knows what is inside the black hole. After one millisecond, the needle almost reaches the speed of light. It releases a huge amount of energy into the atmosphere. If you look at it in slow motion, you can see how the air is ionized. That is, the air molecules are split. In nature, this process occurs during lightning flashes. Our sun also has ionizing energy and disinfects the air. The needle cuts through the Earth's atmosphere. The sky is lit up with a bright light. All the clouds and every water molecule around the needle instantly evaporate at the high temperature. The sky becomes crystal clear hundreds of miles around the spot. In the center of this clean circle is the needle, and it's approaching Mount Everest. Hundreds of thousands of tons of snow burn up as soon as the needle gets close to it. It has reached the speed of light. A thick layer of ground melts and flies away in different directions. It looks like someone has thrown a spear into an ice cream mountain. Everest can't handle so much energy and is torn apart into a million pieces like a sandcastle. 
The incredible power of the blast wave destroys everything around. Stone, wood, soil, leaves, concrete, everything falls apart into billions of pieces because of the powerful energy and heat. Then, all these molecules are erased. The needle moves faster than photons, and as soon as it overtakes the light, it starts to overtake time. From the needle's point of view, all events begin to go in reverse. The mass of the needle becomes infinite, and the greater the mass, the greater the energy. A burst of unthinkable gravitational force absorbs all space. Land, trees, nearby cities, the Earth's crust, and the core, everything disappears in a matter of seconds. A black hole absorbs light and time. An absolute black void has come. The black hole is growing. Holographic International Space Station is shrinking thanks to the strong pressure of gravity and is being pulled into a black void. Then it's the moon's turn. The force of gravity increases quickly. The hole is getting heavier and more massive. All the planets of the solar system collapse as the gravitational black giant grows. The sunlight goes in and never comes back. The black hole becomes thousands of times heavier than the sun. Our star splits into millions of thin strips of light, like spaghetti, and spits out powerful streams of energy. An empty sector of outer space with an expanding black hole is in the place where our solar system was just moments ago. Meteorites flying past it also fall into the trap. Just one small needle managed to cause such a disaster. The simulation ends. The program breaks down because it can't calculate further events. You realize it was a bad idea after all. You decide you'll try to get the energy from the Earth's core instead. Here's a random thought. Try to imagine the animals that could become the new top species should humans go extinct, that is. <laughs> Tricky, right? I mean, we are pretty cool with our high intelligence, fashion sense, ability to cook, and smartphones. Even if we forget the password sometimes. But if we suddenly disappeared, what animals might evolve to develop our skills and build complex societies like we have? Or would they come up with something better? Scientists have some ideas, thanks to modern gene sequencing technology and our understanding of evolution. We know that the climate on the planet will continue to change, so many species will need to adapt to survive. Convergence, which is when two unrelated organisms end up developing similar traits to succeed in a particular environment or fill a niche, will also play a big role. For example, fish are perfected for life in water with their torpedo-like bodies and fins. But dolphins have evolved a very similar body, even though they're warm-blooded, air-breathing mammals with a completely different evolutionary background. So, maybe some animals could develop hands similar to ours to fill the same role as humans, like building cities and modifying the environment. Primates like chimpanzees and bonobos are already close to that with their opposable thumbs, which they use to make tools in the wild. It's also possible that birds, the only surviving dinosaurs, could become the new smartest animals if humans suddenly disappear. Birds are incredibly brainy and can flock together in large groups. Some, such as sociable weavers, even build communal nesting sites, though they may not look like human metropolises. And let's not forget octopuses, which are probably the smartest non-human animals on Earth. They can learn to distinguish between real and virtual objects and engineer their environment. However, adapting to life on land might be tricky for them. You see, there's a lot we don't know about animal intelligence. And let's be honest, we humans have been quite arrogant about it throughout history. In the past, people used to think that animal intelligence could be neatly organized into a hierarchy, with humans at the top and insects at the bottom. But in the 1960s, a new generation of researchers challenged this idea and suggested that intelligence should be measured in relative rather than absolute terms. As technology has improved, we've been able to see animals for longer without disturbing them, and we've discovered they are far more intelligent than we once thought. For example, researchers in Melbourne are using remote-controlled drones to study the breeding patterns of southern right whales, and artificial intelligence is helping us track and predict the movements of all sorts of creatures. It's funny how we tend to recognize intelligence in animals when their behavior is similar to our own. Dolphins, for example, use names and even have accents. In fact, 
Researchers have found that dolphins in southern Brazil have developed a distinct accent after interacting with local fishers for over 100 years. But it's not just mammals that are intelligent. Birds and insects are pretty smart, too. Parrots, for example, have complex social groups and can differentiate between members of their species based on their relationships with each other. And even though their brains are tiny, like mine, insects are capable of some pretty impressive cognitive feats, like tool use and learning by observation. We used to think that intelligence was unique to humans and maybe a few other primates, but now we know that's not the case. In fact, research has shown that intelligence is distributed in different ways across the animal kingdom. Some animals excel in one area, but may not be as good in another. It's all about the environmental pressures that each species faces and how they adapt to them. We all know about the usual suspects when it comes to high intelligence in the animal kingdom. Chimps, dogs, dolphins, blah blah blah. But there are some unexpected additions to the list that might surprise you. And you might even have one of them napping in your lap right now. I'm talking about our feline friends, house cats. They're renowned masters of getting treats and avoiding baths. But did you know they're also pretty smart? Cats have an amazing ability to learn from observation and repetition, which is why we've coined the term copycats. And some cats, like the one in this next story named Nora, take it to the next level. Nora's owner spends her days teaching kids to play piano, and this cat was getting a little jealous of all the attention they were receiving. So what did she do? She watched them closely, picked up on their movements, and started tapping away at the keys herself. And you know what? It worked. Nora's owner and the kids were amazed, and Nora became a little bit of a piano sensation. She even sits at the piano like a proper piano student. Just because she doesn't have opposable thumbs doesn't mean she can't be a musical prodigy. But wider paws would help to hit those octaves. The next story is about rats. Now don't jump on the couch in fear just yet. And before you go calling them pests, did you know that some rats are actually helping save lives? Researchers in Africa have been training these furry little detectives to sniff out lung disease in saliva samples. And they're really good at it, too. These rats have a nose for the job and can detect different scents that are needed to show whether a sample contains a certain bacterium or not. Now, you might be wondering why rats were chosen for this important job. It's because they're super smart and quick learners. These rats go through a series of training exercises to learn how to sniff out different samples. They then alert their trainers to which samples hold bacteria. And get this, they can do it in just 7 minutes a task that would take a human scientist a full day of testing, these rats can do in a fraction of the time. Dr. Rat. Now, ever heard of Nellie the pig? She's surely not your average swine. This clever piggy has proved that animal intelligence goes way beyond just performing tricks. Nellie was presented with a series of challenges, including putting differently shaped items through a hoop. Now, while she was being taught to put round objects through a round hoop, Nelly decided to take it to the next level. When presented with objects that weren't round, she compared their shape with a hoop before deciding they wouldn't fit. This pig has some serious problem-solving skills. It's fascinating to see how pig brains process spatial awareness and solve different tasks. Who knew these curly-tailed creatures were such smarty pants? Now, elephants are probably some of the most amazing animals on Earth, not just because of their looks. They are not only cute, but they're also super smart and empathetic. These gentle giants are known for their incredible cooperation and coordination skills, which they use to protect their families and scare away their enemies. In the wild, elephants travel in clans and communicate with each other using low-frequency rumbles. They work together to keep their young ones safe from predators, and they're not afraid to show their dominance by kidnapping calves from competing clans. Researchers have found out that elephants are quick learners and can work together to achieve a common goal. They even show empathy toward each other, which is a pretty rare feature in the animal kingdom. For instance, elephants have a special interest in the remains of their own kind. They'll linger near elephant bones and investigate sticks of ivory much longer than they would pieces of wood. Also, when an elephant is feeling upset, other elephants will come to comfort it by stroking its head with their trunks or even putting their trunk in its mouth. Now, how sweet is that? In 2010, 
One elephant in particular really impressed scientists with his skills. He was seeing eyeing some tasty fruit just out of his trunk's reach. After pondering for a few days, he had his aha moment. He discovered a large plastic block and used it as a stepping stool to reach the fruit. He continued to use his newfound tool skills to reach even higher places, stacking blocks to get his favorite treat. Some strange seismic activity begins all over the world. Volcanoes on the planet are waking up. But instead of lava, fiery stones, and black ash, they release an invisible gas that slowly fills the atmosphere. This gas is safe for all mammals and insects, but for some reason, it harms people. Gas masks, medication, nothing helps. It's like Earth says, hey people, I've had enough, get out of here. To survive, humanity decides to move to a place where the gas can't reach, underwater. We begin global migration to the seas and oceans. The first thing we need to do is build underwater cities. Engineers use anti-corrosive metals and building materials that are not destroyed by moisture, so there are no problems with the construction. But there are too many people on the planet, which means we need to move further and further from the shore, and the deeper the bottom, the stronger the pressure. To build an ordinary underwater house, it's necessary to create equipment capable of withstanding the water column. Also, it requires expensive materials. Stainless steel is not enough. There should be strong alloys of metals to resist colossal pressure. All of this takes a lot of time, and while some are building cities moving deeper foot by foot, others are crowding in coastal parts. Ponds and lakes are becoming the best places to live. First, it's much easier to swim in fresh water. People spend much less energy and time on movements there. Secondly, fresh water doesn't require powerful filtration used in seas and oceans. And thirdly, there are fewer people in ponds and lakes, which makes the water cleaner. Therefore, all the rich people live there, and the poor survive in the oceans. Famous auto brands create stylish submarines and closed boats with filtration systems. Scientists, together with engineers, come up with a technology that quickly extracts oxygen from water. One box with this technology constantly fills every house with fresh air. And another special box sucks all the carbon dioxide out of the room and releases it into the water. Clothing brands create stylish diving suits. The ocean is cold, so designers install a heating system inside clothing. People used to collect sneakers, but now they wear fashionable fins. There are thousands of fin designs with various engravings and patterns. People create underwater mills to generate electricity and build underwater vacuum pipes inside which high-speed trains drive. But the most remarkable thing is aquatic farms, where livestock eats grass and seeds. There are also incubators with plants that produce extra oxygen. The human body is also changing. The skin becomes smoother and the muscles get stronger. Life in the ocean is a continuous overcoming of water resistance. And you also need to carry an oxygen tank with you. So every day is like a good training in a gym. Take a look at the Olympic swimming champions. Now, most people have such a figure. Doctors, biologists, and engineers unite to create unique masks that allow people to breathe in the water like fish without oxygen tanks. People get much less sunlight underwater and lose vitamin D. This causes depression and weakens the immune system. To fix this problem, scientists build huge ultraviolet lamps that illuminate the entire seabed. People are getting used to a new life. In a sense, it's not much different from the previous one. Everyone also goes to cafes, cinemas, shopping, and the gym. People get an education, work, and use the same law system. Only now, instead of walking down the streets, they swim. Water resources are rich in oil, minerals, and other valuable things. This ensures the growth of the economy. Megacities have appeared in the deep waters of the oceans, and seas and lakes are becoming resorts. The conditions on the surface have become completely unsuitable for humans. And the next generations don't even know what it is like to live on land. Meanwhile, tracks of people on the surface disappear. Abandoned houses are overgrown with moss and vines. Animals fill cities. Seismic activity causes earthquakes that carry all buildings underground. 
humanity made room for a new species, fish. Several hundred million years ago, the ocean was inhabited by giant monsters. The smaller fish couldn't fight these big guys, so they swam as close to the shore as possible. Then, over the years of evolution, they began to change. Fish grew limbs and learned to crawl on the ground. And so, after a couple hundred million years, they began to turn into mammals. And after that, people appeared. At least, that's what the theory of evolution says. Approximately the same story happened with modern fish. Only instead of sea monsters, they faced people in the ocean. Bright light, oxygen consumption, emissions of harmful gases, and garbage forced the fish to migrate first into the depths of the oceans. And then, as humans began to master the depths, the fish swam to the surface. But not because there wasn't enough space in the ocean, but because people started catching too much fish. It's problematic to grow grains, fruits, and vegetables underwater, even in closed farms. Therefore, to replenish the food supply, people just started fishing. To survive, the marine inhabitants had to swim to the surface. Now fish grow limbs to crawl. But when the dangers of people are left behind, the fish face a new problem – mammals. The population of bears, tigers, wolves, and all animals has increased since people left the surface. Now the predators are the rulers of the continent. The hardest struggle for survival begins. Fish learn to disguise themselves to hide from enemies. Many grow venomous spines, while others gain the ability to strike hard with their fins. But octopuses evolve the least. These clever creatures are the first to grab sticks and stones to fend off bears. They learn to dig holes in the ground and pluck fruit from trees. And soon, they become heads of the sea kingdom. Meanwhile, people are building powerful spaceships to find another planet to inhabit. There's too little space in the ocean, and the water is too dirty. Ventilation systems are pumping too much oxygen out of the ocean, releasing a lot of carbon dioxide. Seaweed and photoplankton, which provide more than half of the world's oxygen reserves, are disappearing because of human activity. People understand they have to leave Earth. Gradual migration begins. Humanity has been evacuated from the planet on giant ships for several centuries. They're flying to an exoplanet, just a couple hundred light years from Earth. Octopuses are becoming more intelligent than mammals. They see millions of giant ships flying out of the ocean and rising to the sky. The picture seems familiar to them. There's a memory of similar events somewhere in the depths of their DNA. The brain of octopuses develops faster thanks to the gas coming from the volcanoes. They become full-fledged masters of Earth. Animals and fish live next to them as pets. Then the octopuses build houses, invent the wheel, and open fire. From this moment, a new history of the planet begins – the era of octopuses. They create their civilization and find traces of the old one. Archaeologists with tentacles suggest that strange creatures lived on Earth once upon a time. They had four limbs and could walk upright. These creatures built their civilization here, but something happened, and these guys just disappeared. And while the octopuses are trying to figure out what happened to the previous civilization, people surf the expanses of space and meet a new, highly intelligent life. These humanoids look like octopuses since they have long tentacles, large eyes, and a developed brain. They tell people that once upon a time, they lived on planet Earth. But then plants and trees began to emit something called oxygen that poisoned the air. At first, the octopuses hid in the ocean, but oxygen filled the water. So they decided to leave the planet. Some of them adapted to the new conditions and stayed in the water with the fish. People tell them what happened next, including the history of humankind. The space octopuses realize that the story has now looped. Try to imagine what it would be like if you woke up one day and everything around you was pink. And I mean literally not just having a think pink vibe. Everything from your walls to your bed, desk, armchair, and even the clothes you wear would be rosy. Would you be able to live in such a world for a whole week? Your first thought might be, is there something wrong with my eyes? For most people, the answer is no. 
Even if there was something wrong with your vision, the chances are you wouldn't end up seeing just one single color for the rest of your life. Most people who are colorblind are born that way. Even though there are rare cases in which you can develop this condition later in life. And even those people who are totally colorblind see the world only in black, white, and gray. Most people with colorblindness have problems perceiving certain colors. Their greatest difficulty is distinguishing the shades of the same color. But let's get back to our pink world, shall we? Is pink a special color for our brain? When you think about pink objects, you most likely associate them with emotions like love and kindness. In some cases, looking at the color pink for longer periods of time can actually make people feel more agitated. In sports, teams have been known to paint the opposing team's locker room pink in an attempt to decrease their energy and performance. This tactic was implemented by an American coach who believed the all-pink room would mess with the minds of the opposing teams. What if I told you that this specific shade of pink you woke up to had special powers, though? In the 1970s, a scientist named Alexander Schaus found a color that made people feel calm and relaxed. After lots of experiments to test the effects of different colors on people's behavior, he found this specific color which he named the Schaus Pink. His study showed that when people looked at a bright color, they lost strength in their muscles. But when they looked at the color blue, their strength returned to normal. The researcher talked about this in public lectures and even showed it on TV. He invited a bodybuilder and concluded that they could not do a single bicep curl after staring at the pink color. Schaus was so sure of his discovery that he even suggested that prisons should paint holding cells pink to calm people down. Two officers at a U.S. prison tested this idea by painting one holding cell pink and found that some inmates became calmer after being in the pink cell for 15 minutes. In any case, Schaus's original research hasn't been proven to be true by the following studies, but that doesn't mean you can't mm. test it out for yourself. There's no way to tell how your brain might react to living in a pink world for a day, a week, or even a whole month. It all has to do with your previous experience with this color. If it was a happy one, you might actually like living in a pink environment. However, it may be hard on your eyes after a certain point. But we can't say that the colors we surround ourselves with don't affect us. Carl Jung, a famous Swiss psychoanalyst, developed a theory of color psychology, also known as Jungian color theory. He believed that each color meant something different somewhere in the back of our mind and had the power to reveal deeper thoughts. He thought that colors could be used to understand an individual's innermost thoughts and feelings. For example, he considered the color blue to be formal and precise, while green made people feel relaxed and patient. While looking at the color yellow, people became more sociable, and if you liked the color red, it meant you were competitive and strong-willed. Pink isn't the only color people have studied to see its effects on the brain. Let's take green for instance. Would you feel better living in a green world? Well, looking at this color can actually help you focus better Studies have shown that people who take short breaks to look at pictures of green things, like trees or grass, concentrate better on boring tasks and make fewer mistakes. This is because green is a soothing color that is easy for our eyes and brain to see. I mean, it's the color we often find in nature, so it's no wonder most of us find it soothing. When it comes to red and orange, we should use these in moderation. So, no orange houses for me, thank you. These colors can make you feel more energized and active, but too much can be bad. Researchers concluded that being surrounded by red or orange for long periods of time can make us fussy. Let's not forget about blue. It can make you feel calm and rested, but it can also make you feel gloomy, especially those darker shades. Waking up in a blue world might come with its own set of problems, depending on the shade. Then there's the problem with blue light. It's the type of light screens emit. At times, it can be bad for your sleep because such a light can trick your brain into thinking it's still daylight. It can make it hard for your body to produce the hormones you need to fall asleep at the right hours. 
To avoid these issues, it's a good idea to avoid blue light screens for at least an hour before bed. How about our eyes? Is staring at the same color for longer periods of time any good for us? Not really. If you look at one color for a long time, for starters, it can change the way you see other colors. Back in the day, people used old computer screens that featured a lot of green hues. Because they were exposed to this color a lot during a normal working day, they would see everything with a purple tint for a while after they stopped using the computer. The explanation is simple. The part of the eye that was responsible for seeing green got tired. It got compensated by other parts of the eye that were more rested, those responsible for the red and blue hues. What do you get when you combine red with blue? That's right, purple! These days, most people use computer screens that are white with black letters, so this problem doesn't happen as much. This change in our eyesight is also explained by the McCullough effect. It's a phenomenon that happens when people perceive a change in color of an object after it has been looked at for a long period of time. In 1965, Celeste McCullough found out that if you looked at colorful stripes for too long, it could affect how you saw things for months. Her experiment had people looking at colorful stripes, then at black and white ones. If you do this for long enough, you'll end up seeing the monochrome lines in color too. Just like how a camera flash can make your vision go blurry for a bit, this effect can last for a long time if you look at the stripes for too long. Does the color you stare at make any difference to your eyesight? Well, not really. There is no evidence to suggest that a certain color can trigger the McCullough effect. It's rather caused by a combination of factors, like changes in the way the brain processes visual information, fatigue of the eye muscles, and changes in the way the eye's retina responds to light. What about light? Exposure to some sunlight is important for our well-being, but you've surely heard this one since you were little. Don't stare directly at the sun. Is there really any evidence that it affects our eyes? Or is it just another myth? Turns out, it is indeed dangerous. When you stare at the sun for an extended period, ultraviolet light enters your eyes. It then gets through the internal lens onto the retina and reaches the back of the eye. When this light-sensitive tissue is exposed to UV rays, it can get damaged. You'll end up seeing spots for longer than just a few seconds or even have permanent eyesight damage. This process can happen quickly, even in just a few seconds of direct sun gazing. It was hot in the tropics, a type of heat unknown to the men aboard the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria ships led by Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. It had been months since these men left their home cities in Europe, and until then, Europe was all they knew. They were given a difficult and even dangerous task. Spain hired Columbus to find a new western route to Asia. They needed new routes for trading and buying spices, but it was far from a simple job. I mean, crossing the ocean never is. Little did those sailors know that their lives were about to change forever. Land in sight! Someone must have shouted on board. But when they finally stepped on that new foreign land, they discovered they were not in Asia. They had landed in the Americas. You've probably heard this tale before. Historically speaking, Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492. But what would have happened if Columbus's ship had faced a lethal storm in the Atlantic Ocean and had never made it to the new land? What would today's history look like? First things first, nobody discovered anything. When we say that the Americas were discovered, we're kind of ignoring the millions of people who already lived there. You see, the Americas were only discovered from Europe's point of view. Columbus would only have discovered something if when he got there, he was faced with acres and acres of empty land. But that was not the case at all. Second, Columbus was not the first explorer to land in the Americas. Believe it or not, the Vikings approached American shores in the 10th century. Their expeditions have been well documented and accepted by scholars. Here's what might have happened. Around the year 1000 CE, Viking explorer Leif Erikson sailed to a place called Vinland. Cute name, huh? It's now a region in Canada called Newfoundland. But his crew didn't stay too long. 
They arrived to find 10 Native Americans napping under their overturned canoes. They attempted some trade, but I'm guessing the Vikings weren't too friendly and the Americans didn't really like them. The Vikings' account of the encounter shows they felt outnumbered and menaced, so they sailed away back to their land. That makes sense, right? As I said earlier, there were millions of people living in the ginormous continent of the Americas. Any foreigner would be outnumbered there. Now take a look at what North America looked like before our buddy Chris got there. It was not divided into the normal states we're used to. And if Columbus had never arrived, the United States would probably never have been united to begin with. After all, there were hundreds of first Americans living in these lands, and they lived amongst their own tribes, quite different from the Europeans. It's not accurate to think that there were no political systems going on in the Americas before Europeans arrived. We just need to understand that they were different from what we're used to today. When Europeans arrived, they imported their belief systems with them, from religious beliefs and language systems to things as simple as clothing habits. If the Americas had developed on their own, maybe their sense of fashion would be completely different today. You see, Europeans had a developed sense of fashion by the time they arrived in the West. They wore things such as this and this. But those don't really work in the tropics, do they? For them, fashion had to do with showing a certain economic status, while in the Americas, that didn't exist. For Native Americans, clothing was mainly functional and related to the weather. In warmer climates, Native people would wear short-like cloths to cover their intimate parts. They would walk bare-chested and use shoes known as moccasins. Yes, similar to the moccasins you probably own. In colder climates, they would resort to using leather and fur parkas. Of course, there was always the special clothing used for ceremonial purposes. So I'm guessing that if Columbus never reached the Americas, Brands such as the Gap, Hollister, and Forever 21 would have never existed. But we could live with that, couldn't we? Here's a wild thought. Let's say that by the 1700s, Native Americans had developed complex engineering skills. They built big boats, maybe a bit smaller in size than the traditional European ships, and decided to venture across the ocean. Let's say they were the ones who arrived on European shores, in places such as Spain and Portugal. They carried gifts and goods with them for trading, of course. This was also a common practice amongst them back home, known as potlatch. Sure, they were received with suspicion by the Europeans, who had only ever traded with Asia. But with this inverted encounter, a different type of relationship began between Native Americans and Europeans. Since Europeans didn't claim ownership of the Americas, the people from the so-called New Land weren't considered inferior to them. Actually, they stood side by side as equals, each one with their own power and set of knowledge. Native Americans taught Europeans a new type of ruling system, a more decentralized one. So modern-day structures of government would look really different. Maybe Europeans decided that four years was a long time for someone to hold decision power, so they implemented smaller and more frequent elections. Oh, and the landscape of European cities also changed a lot. Instead of huge statues made of copper and bronze showing men and ships on their way to the Americas, the Europeans built totem poles in honor of their alliances with first Americans. In terms of medical and medicinal knowledge, they had a lot to exchange about. While Europeans were making advances in traditional medicine, Americans had developed an impressive knowledge of herbs that could heal a series of things. Before they knew it, Europeans were selling different varieties of plants in their pharmaceutical establishments. They had one big barrier though, language. Since Europeans never arrived on American shores, they also never taught their language to Americans. So maybe in this scenario, both cultures brought in their best linguists and tried creating a new language from scratch. Something that could be comprehensible from both perspectives and that could encompass both of their worldviews. The implications of this on modern-day life would be really profound if you stop to think about it. Let's say that this newly created language involved some symbols and drawings in it. You see, Native Americans often told stories using symbols known as pictograms. They were quite literal sometimes. As you can see, a mountain was represented by, well, a mountain. 
It's crazy to think that this system of communication has been around for 5,000 years, since it was actually invented by the Sumerians. And hey, maybe even our laptop keyboards would come equipped with these symbols, and you could write more visually hybrid and fun emails than the ones you write today. The American landscape would have also changed. You see, if neither Columbus nor any of the other European dudes that went after him reached the so-called new land, Central and Latin American cities would look completely different than they do today. Maybe the bustling empires of the time, such as the Inca, the Maya, and the Aztec, would have grown immensely. To be fair, they were already pretty big by the time Europeans got there. Some pre-Columbian Maya cities were as big as medieval London and Paris in terms of population. But oh my! The Mayan Empire would have grown so much that it could have spread out all over of Central America. They could have developed their pyramid building craft up to the point that they managed to build an even larger pyramid than the Giza Pyramid in Egypt. So tourists would come from all over the world to visit. Ah, and in South America? Let's just say the region could have turned into a huge forest, bigger than the Amazon. The Inca could have spread through the Andes and then into the mainland. Places such as Brazil and Argentina never existed. But in their place, there would have been dreamy tropical settlements, which would have become a worldwide reference in sustainable living.